You say, Amen. you know, this is what grace feels like. The, the presence that's here is, is grace and healing and peace. And God's ready to do some things, some very powerful things with uh, everyone here that hears this word. God is going to do something very powerful in your hearts, in your mind, and in your spirit. And so I want to thank God, first of all, for allowing me to be able to present the word of God. And for Pastor, for allowing me to do this. Amen. I, I don't take it lightly uh, because every word that I speak, God is going to judge. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn with me to Psalms 11, Psalms chapter 11. I've started a series on anthropomorphism, anthropomorphism, which is really the how God relates to us or how we can relate to God is him showing us or speaking to us by appendages, by his eyes, hands, legs, arms. And so he'll say things in the word of God, like the arm of the Lord or, or the eyes of God. And in this study... I did the mouth of God on Wednesday, and today I'm going to do the eyes of God. This is very profound, what I've studied and found. So in Psalms 11, 1 through 5, do I need to get the other mic? I'm good? Okay. Yeah, I get it? All right. Hallelujah. Psalms 11, 1 through 5. In the Lord, I put my trust. <laughs> Amen. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. In the foundations, are, are, I'm sorry, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy and all that you're doing by your spirit, Lord. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would hide me behind you and let not my flesh glory in your presence, but you have right away to speak to your people. Father, I thank you for your grace and mercy over our life. I thank you for what you have prepared for us today. Have your way. Speak to me and through me. I thank you and honor you. And we ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. And God's people would say, Amen. Amen. Glory to God. I want to, I'm going to give you a little statistics, something that Pastor Patricia said that's very powerful, that no communication is communication. And statistically, 56% of communication is body language. Our, when we look at someone, we're, we're looking at body language. We're sizing them up, seeing if they're going to receive as we get closer or get ready to speak. So human eyes don't function like God's eyes. God's eyes do not function like human eyes. 
Our eyes are organs that detect light. God's eyes is spirit that detects and sees intent. When our eyes captures an image, the image is sent to our brain to be developed and then processed. God's eyes looks at the heart of mankind, captures the intentions, and sends that information to his son, Jesus, for alignment to his word. So God looks at the intent of men and women. As we try to, as we do serve God, and we try to do our best in serving the Lord, we a lot of times go back to trying to serve God out of a human perspective. And we cannot serve God from a human perspective because God is spirit, amen? And we're spiritual beings. And so our intentions are seen clearly by the Spirit of God. God's eyes look at the heart. He captures those intentions and then sends it to Jesus for the Word of God to judge it. The Son of God, God Himself, and the Holy Spirit sees clearly our intentions. The most sensitive part of our eye is the macula of the retina. The macula is responsible for our critical focusing vision. It is the part of the retina that is mainly used. We use it to read or to stare intently at objects. The most sensitive part of God's eyes is called the apple. In Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8, very powerful scripture. But it reads in this manner. For thus says the Lord of hosts, he sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Now the apple is... It, it, it's, it's a true function in our eye. It's the most sensitive part in our eye. But God says that that is what's sensitive to him. Is we are considered so sensitive to God. It's so important that anyone that touches God's people touches the most sensitive part of God. In this scripture, when the word touch, it means those who produce harm. The apple of his eye refers to our eye, known as the pupil. This is an endearing expression suggesting how important people are to God because of his covenant with us. The analogy is compared with the smallest thing that might produce harm. What is so powerful about <laughs> this is that God is reacting to the intentions of someone or the intentions of principalities that are trying to bring harm to us. This is what's important for us to be sensitive to the spirit of God because it's the spirit of God that moves us to do, to hear and to feel the things of God. God has a better handle on what is happening in our lives than we do. Can you say amen? amen? Therefore, listening to God becomes more imperative because of the intentions of other people and the intentions of principalities against our life. 
It's more crucial at this day and time that we listen to the Holy Spirit and his movings when he tells us to do something and we don't understand, God, why are you asking me to do this? Nevertheless, I trust you with me and I'm going to move. When the Lord told me to shut my church down, twice he told me to shut my church down. I didn't understand both times, but I listened. And I thank God that I listened because the first time he told me there was a lot of turmoil that was happening within my family. Just found out that my late wife had cancer and some other things that we found out about our children that had happened to them when they were growing up. And so I needed that time to be able to minister to my family and running a church, I wouldn't be able to do that. But God knows my heart and my intention is to stay faithful to any ministry that he puts me in. I don't quit ministry. And he knows that. But if he talks to me, I move. Our job is not to figure out who is coming against us or who's plotting things against us. It's not our job to do that. Our job is to locate the lost and bring them back to the fold, regardless of what we see in here. Oh, can I get an amen? amen. Let me say it again, because th th this is important. Our job is to locate the lost and bring them back into the fold, regardless of what we see or hear, regardless of what we go through, regardless of what is happening in our life, Jesus' last command is to go out and bring them in. Pastor Patricia said something powerful. Have we lost God? Have we regressed back so far that we no longer see the hurting? Because God sees them. Man, it's not even my sermon. Why am I going there? Okay. When we start paying attention to the attacks, this is, we lose sight of faith that sees the Lord leading us to victory through the Spirit of God. When we start focusing on what's happening to me, how the attacks are happening to me, what's happening to my finances, what's happening to my family, we lose sight of faith. Trusting that God already knows, he's already set provision. This is the powerful thing about Lord. When we're walking with God, God knows everything that's going to happen in our life. So he's already set provision along the way. But we have to be led by the Spirit to the provision. The Spirit of God is what leads us there. And so... When we start paying attention to what's attacking us and how we're being hurt and, and this person said this and this person did that and said that, we lose sight of God. So let's look at my first point, the eyes of man. In our first verse, our second verse of Psalms 11, for look, the wicked bend their bow, they make ready their arrow on the string, that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. So there are people that are plotting out there secretly against us. Uh, when, I was, when I first opened my church in 1996, and as we're setting up and getting everything together. There was a person that came into our church and uh, he was a, a satanic person. And we began to, uh, you know, worship and, and praise God. And he gloriously gave his life to the Lord. Amen. 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 And he began to show me a strategy of what Satanists were doing. 
And so what he did is he had a map of, of the city of Phoenix. And every church that was making an impact in the city, they set up people that would live around that area. And they would purposely go out in the middle of night and they would go to the church grounds and they would pray against the churches. They were strategically doing this. He said, when we came and we prayed against your church, we got attacked. I said, what, what do you mean you got attacked? He said, we got attacked. It was like there was some kind of protection. I said, I know exactly what kind of protection that was, glory to God. And I believe we have the same protection in this church. Now, I say that to say this, is that there are people that are secretly setting up trying to destroy your walk with God. Trying to make you focus on the, the humanity fight or the fleshly fight instead of the spiritual fight. We react to what we see. In our scripture, David acknowledges that those after him aim at his intent, the heart, that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart, that what I do that is upright in me, the enemy is focusing on what is right in me. He wants to destroy what's right in me. The enemy will use anyone, someone, to bring an attack on us and then aim it at the true intent of being right before God. Have you ever noticed when you do something right before the Lord and, it's, and then things start happening wrong and you're like, God, I just did everything right. The enemy's trying to get you to focus on what went wrong. <laughs> Don't focus on what went wrong. Focus on what you did right. Yeah. This is keeping your eyes on the things that are above and not below. This is keeping your intentions to serve God. Father, everything I do, I do for you. I'm not doing it for my pastor. I'm not doing it for the people. I'm doing it for you, God. That is the intention that we need to have in our hearts. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says this, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. We should never have an argument or a fight against someone who has come against us. The fight is not with them. It's with principalities and rulers of darkness. The enemy plans to get us to operate out of a dark place rather than a well-lit place of truth. He wants us to stay in a dark place and operate from darkness rather than operating from a well-lit place. So Jesus says something. He says, that those who are serving God, those who are of God, they come to the light that their deeds may be seen clearly. This is talking about a functioning and an operating in the kingdom of God under the light of God. So that every intention is revealed. Listen, the gifts that people have, like the prophets and prophecy and people see things, it's because they're in the light. <laughs> And when you walk in the light, God reveals what's in, what comes in your vicinity. He illuminates it. So the gift is not just for certain people. It's for every single person that walks in the light. Every single person. But if you're not walking in the light, then you can't see because it's dark. The enemy plans to keep us there. See, the truth is God's light and God's glory. 
When we see things changing or happening out of character, we often rely on our own understanding of sight. So I'm just giving you a perspective of how we look at things, and then I'm going to switch over to the perspective of God. But when we see things changing or happening out of character, we often rely on our own understanding of sight instead of God's understanding of insight. So there's sight and there's insight, meaning you're looking beyond what you see. Sight introduces us to faith. Think about it. Jesus died on the cross. We've seen that. It introduces us to believe that what he did is going to cause us to live forever if we repent. So it introduces us to faith. Insight helps build our faith. Because insight is the word of God that's being preached. And God, when, when, whenever the word is preached, you guys have heard me say this before, you're not looking at the man or even listening to the man. You're listening for God in the man. That's insight. If a person had a problem with me and they didn't come to church because they had a problem with me or they're not listening, oh, Pastor Wolf is now because they're operating out of sight, not insight. We should never allow anyone to stop us from coming into the presence of God and listening for his direction of where he wants to take us. Amen. We have two operating modes when we see things happening against us. We have fight and flight. David shows his faith when he says in Psalms 11.1, 1, In the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? David is saying, how are you telling me to, to, to run? I didn't run from Goliath. <laughs> what makes you think I'm going to run from you? You know, when we were in the world, we didn't run from fights. So now we're saved and we're running from the devil. When we got God. <laughs> My daddy's bigger than every daddy. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Remember that? We, remember that, Kelly? I'm going to go get my dad. <laughs> I ain't got to get my dad. My dad's always with me. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. So David was continually choosing to fight, but he fought with faith. David's faith in God always prevailed over his circumstances. When you study David's life, his faith in God always prevailed over his circumstances. He did some shady things. I am, I'm not even going to lie. He did some very shady things. I mean, he acted like he was crazy, slobbering at the mouth of Ziglag. <laughs> he did some crazy things. But he did it in faith. <laughs> when these things begin to happen and our faith is not anchored in Christ. We leave from where God has placed us and run for cover. And it's usually a mountain. A mountain that is located in the world. Flee as a bird to your mountain is what the word scripture says. Matthew chapter 18 verse 12 says this. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, as surely I say to you, he rejoices oh, more over that sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. 
We become entrenched in our jobs. We become entrenched in this world. And when things begin to happen that we don't understand, we run to the mountains of the world. We run to their, to that false security. Uh, and they're, they're oh. okay, I'm going to say it, Lord. So I was raised by my mom. My dad left us. And being raised by my mom, and I watched other men being raised by their mothers, and I seen some differences. One of the things that my mom did is she forced me to be a man the best way that she could from a woman's perspective. She taught me how to be a gentleman. She uh, spoke to me about never hitting them, I, but I already had that in my head anyways. I was never going to hit a woman ever in my life. Never did. And so, uh, and when things happen in my life, my mom didn't come running to my rescue. She allowed me to go through some things. And so I see some men today who were raised by their mothers. Not in this church. I'm just going to let you know, not in this church. <laughs> and as soon as they start going through something and they're married, they go running to their wife. <laughs> you know what happened? Instead of standing and fighting this thing through and leading the family, they back up, cower, call in mom or call in someone instead of standing and fighting. Running to the mountain is a false security. In battle, mountains are higher ground, afforded better cover, and a sight to see the enemy coming. This is why in war or conflict, we run to where we can see better to protect ourselves from any enemy. This is the flight without faith. In the Bible, God tells us to run from one thing, Flee fornication. That's the only thing he tells us to run from. Amen? Amen? Everything else he says, stand and fight. In this battle, we ask ourselves, I've asked myself, God, do you see me? Do you really see me? Because if you see me, why is all this happening? Why is all this going on in my life? Why did that have to happen to my child? Why did that have to happen to my wife? Why did that have to happen to my ministry? I don't get it, God. Do you really see me? Does God see all that I'm going through? Does he see the lies that were told on me and about me? the false accusations, the deceit. If God sees what I'm going through, what is the meaning of his reaction to it? These are the questions that we have because we function off of what we see. And we'll have those questions. God sees the intent of our hearts. During this time, God works in us and on us while building a defense against our attacker. If we would have faith and trust him, just trust what he's doing with us, what he's allowing to happen in our life. If we just trust him because he's doing something powerful in the background that we don't see. But if we just trust him and continue to walk with him, it will all be revealed in the time where God says it's appropriate. Now let's look at God's eyes. In verse four, it says the Lord is in the holy temple. 
The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. Eyelids. Think about that. Okay. Y'all know we got our eyelids, right? He says, this is going to test you. What does he mean by that? Hmm. Let's get deep. God sees everything in whole. We see things in part. In Psalms 139, verse 11, it says, If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Let me say that again. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. This is, this is the eyes of God, looking through everything, can see through everything. So God doesn't have to process what he sees like us. He sees everything with its intent. His eyes behold. This word behold is defined as a verb. It means behold. Third person present beholds. In this scripture, and there are other parts in the word of God where it says behold, but behold is imparting a sense of safety in that God sees us and is present as the third person. When you see in the scripture, behold, it is saying, I'm here. Behold, I see. Behold, I'm here. I see. I'm with you. Luke chapter 10, verse 3. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Behold, he's saying, go your way. I am with you. I'm sending you out to get eaten up by wolves. But I'm with you. <laughs> He's letting us know I'm present in everything that happens. I'm with you with everything that comes against your life. Every word that's spoken against you, behold. When somebody falsely accuses you, behold. Amen. When things are failing, when you can't pay your rent, behold. We have to keep within our mind and spirit that God is always present with us. We have to keep that at the forefront of our mind, especially when we're going through all types of turmoil in our life. We have to keep that at the forefront of our minds. We have an assurance during the trials of life that the Godhead is always present with us and sees us and everything God going on specifically about us. He knows our conditions, our wants, dangers that awaits us. He knows what our enemies are doing, what they are planning or have planned. I love what David says in the word, he, he, David and Solomon, but they break it down. They say they, they dig pits, but they shall fall in their own pit. They lay nets as to catch a bird, but they shall be caught by their own net. As Haman built the gallow to kill all the Jews, he was hung on what he built. See, God knows, he sees we just have to have faith and trust. All their schemes that they have, knowing this, you guys, rest assured that God will interpose. That word interpose means aid us. He's already set up provision to aid you. When he should and will allow nothing to come upon us which will not serve a purpose or direction. 
God will stop everything that does not serve a purpose that comes against our life. He stops it dead. He will not allow it to come against us. But everything that he does allow, he says there's a purpose. So we have to understand what God is saying. There's purpose in this. There's purpose in your pain. There's purpose in your pain. When bad things happen to us and God allows it, it will serve a powerful purpose to deliver many if we trust God is beholding us. Genesis chapter 16, verse 11 says this. And the angel of the Lord said to her, this is Hagar. You are with child. You are with child and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. Listen, God's heard her affliction. She's in the wilderness, has no food, no water, and God says, I hear it. Wait till you get to the ears of God. Okay. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man. And every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of his brethren. Then she called the name of the Lord. I'm sorry. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. For she said, have I also, have I also here seen him who sees me? Verse 14. Therefore, the well was called Bir Lehero. Observe. It is between Kaddish and Buried. God sees you. I, if you don't hear anything I say today but this, God sees you. He sees your intent. He sees what you want to do, how you want to serve him. He sees the struggles that accompany that. He sees everything that has to do with you. So trust the Lord who sees all. In the Lord I put my trust, David says. In verse 4, the Lord is in the holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. He's, his eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. It is better to trust God and not what you see. Charles Renault quoted something. He says, when I panic, I run. When I run, I lose. When I lose, God waits. When I wait, he fights. When he fights, I learn. I'm going to say it again. When I panic, I run. When I run, I lose. When I lose, God waits. When I wait, he fights. When he fights, I learn. Those that wait. Amen. Those that wait. We must understand that God truly sees everything, and we have to be patient in waiting for him to move on our behalf. Because payday's coming for everyone involved. Payday's coming for everyone involved. That means payday for you that's been waiting and patiently serving God, and payday's coming for everyone that's come against your life if they don't give their life to the Lord. Payday's coming. God truly sees everything. So as I wrap this up, Psalms 118 verse 8 says this. It is better to trust in the Lord 
than to put confidence in man. Amen. Amen. Psalms 115, verse 11. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. May the Lord give you increase more and more, you and your children. See, God had seen us before we were formed. He knows everything. I've seen you in the belly. Psalms 139, verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought. That word wrought means shaped. In the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet uninformed. And in your book, they, shall, they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. So God says, he's telling us here through this word, everything that's happening in your life, I already know because I'm the one that put it all together. I put it all together. I know everything that's happening, so just trust me as you're going through. Trust what I'm doing with you. Trust what's happening. There is purpose in what's going on. Verse 17, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Eyelids usually contract or get smaller when examining something closely. This bold anthropomorphism, I messed up the word. <laughs> I practice so hard on it too. <laughs> Anthropomorphism. <laughs> Stresses the precise ominence of God. Okay? So, so when we start studying about the arm, the eyes, the heart of God, when we start studying that, there's, a, there's something that God is focusing on, that he's stressing on. God examines, tests, or refines the righteous. But he hates the wicked and the people who love violence. God is opposed to all who choose wickedness and violence in opposition to his will. Those who choose him, he says, okay, let me refine you. Let me test you. Let me strengthen you. Those parts that are weak, let me get those strong. Hallelujah. Let me remove what shouldn't be there and put what needs to be there. Trust what I'm bringing you through and what I'm bringing you to. <laughs> Everything we go through is refining us for the master's use. Amen. Everything we go through is refining us for the master's use. I, I, I get the privilege sometimes to talk to Minister V. She, she comes in on Mondays and, and works in the office. And <laughs> we be having a time sometimes <laughs> talking about how we used to be in the world and stuff that we used to do in the gangs and all that stuff. And I came in one time and uh, 
I told her, I was telling her about some demonic forces that were coming against my life. <laughs> she stood up. I know you started fighting, didn't you? <laughs> and I didn't feel like hearing that. I didn't feel like hearing that. I didn't feel like fighting. But when she stood up and said that, it just, it got me like, oh, yeah, let's go. Where you at? <laughs> You know how crazy she gets. <laughs> I wish a devil would. <laughs> you know how she talked. <laughs> but she just got me riled up. You know, we need people like that. When sometimes you're going through something and you just don't have enough fight in you. And someone comes next to you and says, what you mean? I got you. Come on, let's go fight. Amen. God knows right where we're at, and he wants us to react to him. Not to what we see, not to what we hear, not to what we feel. So Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, my favorite portion of scripture, my last scripture. No, I got one more after that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, say all your ways. All your ways. Acknowledge him. Amen. Amen. Everything. Acknowledge God. Everything that happens, acknowledge God's hands in it. Because remember, he fashioned it. He made it. So acknowledge him. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. And I like how Pastor brought this out. He's directing your paths. He's not directing your feet to the path. He's directing the path. When Pastor brought that out, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Say that again. <laughs> Isaiah 26, 4. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah. The Lord is everlasting strength. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise, y'all. So I want to close with this last thing. I was going over this sermon, and as I was going over this sermon, I stumbled upon a person that was teaching something on YouTube. I don't even remember her name. But God told me to stop and listen. And I did, and it, it was powerful. Listen to this. Mastering visualization. The law of attraction, visualization, and manifesting are one in the same. Our brain has a system called the reticular activating system. It is a network of neurons in our brain. The reticular activating system is a filter system that allows certain information in our brain and it blocks out other information. This filter is programmable by us and those who are and were in our past. When we get a negative belief about ourselves, I'm unlovable. The people in my life or at church don't care about me. The reticular activating system is going throughout the day pointing out every single piece of evidence that confirms that negative thought. This is what's in us. There is something called confirmation bias. We latch on to confirmation bias. Confirmation bias means your mind loves to read things that you agree with. Reading things you agree with confirms your filter. The reason we have the reticular activating system is to stop our brain from allowing everything into our brain. It filters it through. So we can't handle that much information all at one time. 
The reticular activating system only allows the stuff that it agrees with. Some of us need to reprogram the reticular activating system. Using visualization will help us reprogram our reticular activating system. This is what billionaires do. Our reticular activating system is to spot opportunity instead of negativity. Our brain will begin to spot evidence that we are advancing positively and it begins with the visualization. So there's something that Dr. Ron does, Apostle Ron does, and I've seen him do it with people in our counseling center. And then I've seen him do it when he counsels some people. And he'll say, close your eyes. So I want all y'all to close your eyes. And he says, I want you to visualize what your life looks like successful serving God, successful financially, your business, if you have one or if you had a dream of one, how successful it looks. How do you feel? Are you really happy? How many people are you blessing because of your blessing? Okay, open your eyes. This is the visualization that she's talking about. Take your goals and things that you want to accomplish. Visualize what your life looks like in these accomplishments. Every morning, visualize what the achievement looks like and how you're going to feel about yourself. When your self-worth has improved, this can be spiritually, financially, and physically. Close your eyes and see yourself specifically what your life looks like in those accomplishments. When you start to see these things, step two is to visualize the positive emotions of how you feel. So first you have the visualization, then you have the emotions that accompany that. You're reprogramming the reticular activating system. I lost my place. Okay. When we start to see these things, step two is to visualize the positive emotions of how you feel. Happy, accomplished, spiritual, spiritual, powerful man or woman of God, focused, loved, at peace. Whatever positive emotion you can visualize, your reticular activating system is seeking out the opportunity to fulfill what you have just visualized. Now you're reprogramming it. You are training your brain to have a different filter. Our brain doesn't know the difference between the real things that happen to us and the imaginary things that happen to us. That's why people can lie really good. Because <laughs> they visualize it. Yeah, I did it, man. I jumped off of five stories. They lying. Whatever we visualize, listen to this, <laughs> whatever we visualize encodes in our brain as a real memory. It changes, it changes the filter. The reticular is activated to seek out evidence of fulfillment of what it just visualized. So, here are some steps. The more you visualize, the greater your confidence. The more things that you see in a positive light, the more confident you become. The greater security you have about what you have visualized because you have reprogrammed your brain to attach to that. In the visual, visualization study show, it helps develop the skill and then improve the skill just as though you were actually doing it. I want you guys to think about this, and this is biblical right here, because when God was building, when uh, God told Solomon to build the temple, and he says that I'm going to send people to you, 
And he, there were different people that hewed out stone, people who did gold and silver and all that. He, all, these, all these people got visualizations of what it would look like. God gave them dreams. And in those dreams, they begin to visualize what it should look like. And then God gave them the skill through what they visualized. This is powerful. God is telling us, listen, there's something that I've given you that has been dormant or the enemy has twisted it in your head. You need to untwist it by being positive and seeking me out and, sh and let me guide you to where I'm taking you, to the purpose that I have for your life. The proof that visualization helps you build skills, and this is proven. Here is the revelation that God gave me after I seen all this. God gives us dreams of things that we are supposed to accomplish according to his will. So we can begin to build the skill through Christ. This is why the word of God says, I can do all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If God gave you the vision of it, you can accomplish it. This is why he says in his word, there's nothing too hard for any man or woman that puts their mind to it. There's nothing too hard for us. Because God will give us the skill through how we visualize it. We can do all things who strengthens us. And then on top of that, God sees the intent of everything that comes against us. God has the ability to guide your life around something or guide your life to something. He has the ability to say, no, you stay in that fire. Because that's what he told Peter. I'm praying for your faith. I'm not taking you out from the enemy sifting you. I'm going to pray for your faith while you're being sifted. Because it's in the sifting, Peter, that you're going to be the powerful man of God that I've called you to be. When he gave him the visualization, the, 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 the dream or the, uh, the, uh, the thing that he's seen of the, of the animals coming down in the blanket. Don't call things common that I have blessed. He had to change his reticular activation. <laughs> so what is God saying to you today? What has he spoken to you today about his eyes? Because he sees the intent. He, he, he's not looking at our action. Listen, our actions don't move God. Our faith does. Which faith is attached to intent. Let's give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If I could have everybody just close your eyes real quick. And I want to ask if there's anyone here that you have never given your life to the Lord. God knows everything that you are going through. He sees everything that's happening in your life. He loves you tremendously. You're here for a purpose. God brought you here. This day was fashioned for you to be here, to hear what you heard, to build your faith and your trust in him no matter what you're facing. And so he's saying to you today, will you serve me? Will you serve me? Will you stop allowing what is happening around you and with you? Will you stop allowing that? 
from serving me. So if you've never given your life to the Lord and you would like to do that, I want you to simply put your hand up, put it down. Is there anybody at all? You've never given your life to the Lord and you would like to give your life to the Lord. Or maybe you have given your life to the Lord and God spoke to you in an awesome way about how he sees everything that's happening. I understand everything that's going on in your life. But trust me with you. Trust what I'm doing with you. Trust that I am refining you. I'm allowing all this to strengthen you, to bring you to a place of plenty and blessing. And so God's calling you back home. You're not right with God and you know you're not right. You're ready to give it up, give it away, stop doing it and trust God. And if you would like to do that, I want you to simply raise your hand, put it up, put it down. Is anybody at all? Yes, God sees those hands. You can put them down. Amen. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, God sees the hands. Yes, you can put them down. Amen. Yes, God sees the hand. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, God sees those hands. Amen. God is in the business of redeeming. God is in the business of leaving the 99 to bring back that one. Hallelujah. And so we have our leaders here. Those of you that rose your hand and those of you, maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you are ready to change things in your life and focus on God. And leave this world alone. I'm ready for you, Lord. I want to do what you want me to do, not what I want to do. We're opening up this time. If you raise your hand, I want you to come on up. Get prayed for. Amen. If you raise your hand, come on up. Come on up. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord praise, church, as they come. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And now I want to say specifically uh, nations, God is telling me to tell you, brother, that what He's doing in you, He's processing things of the world out and he's processing things of himself in you've you've been going through a serious mind battle is what the lord says it's been very very hard the mind battle the struggle the fight god says don't give in continue to fight with him for him he's got you trust what he's doing with you okay don't give up And God says, don't go back. And then he also says, cut them off. And you know who they are. Cut them off. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. My brother, can I pray for you? I want you to come on up here. Amen. Who's this with you? Bring your wife. I'm good. How you doing? Bless you. Amen. Outstanding. So, my sister, God has called you into a purpose. You've been trying to figure out what is it? What's what's the purpose, God, that you have for me? You and this uh, God's kind of showing me your life. So you've always been a person that's operated outside the box. When, when things happen, you didn't really care what people thought. You just did what you thought you needed to do. And in doing that, you've gotten a, you've gotten a focus on who, on who you were as a person. 
but now a purpose. And my brother, God has a purpose for you, a powerful purpose. He's called you from the womb. Hmm. Yeah, he's called you from the womb. I'm not saying to pastor or to preach, but I am saying God wants you to use his word and bring them in. She's got wisdom and understanding that God is going to use her to help you in how you guys need to do this and go about this in a powerful way. Are you ready for God to move on y'all? Are you ready? I want you guys to join hands. Father, I pray for this couple, Lord God, that you strengthen them by your spirit. Father, I pray that you would minister by your Holy Spirit upon them, Lord God, that you would reveal purpose. Father, Lord God, to my sister, Lord God, in direction to my brother, Lord. I praise you, glorify you, and honor you, God. And I ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen. Let's go to the Lord. Praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you for letting me pray for you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Amen. So thank you guys for joining us online. Uh, we're going to let you go at this time. God bless you. I pray that the Lord minister to you. Uh, if you've given your life to the Lord, please let us know. Uh, we would love to hear from you. God bless you. Have a great day. each and every soul, Lord God, that you strengthen each and every person and that this word would saturate their hearts and their minds, Lord. We glorify you and honor you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.